are on the final week of the series, and hasn't it been amazing? Have you guys enjoyed it? Do you remember we started the year with lovers of truth? Do you remember that? And that we can't just say, well, okay, give me the truth, God, let me read the word, but we actually need to embrace the truth, love the truth, and I think God's really tested us because there's certain aspects of God's truth that aren't easy to take, they're not easy to digest, and definitely not easy to actually put into practice. But if we are lovers of truth, we need to take all of God's word. And for those of you who may be just joining us, or maybe you're new to our church, or maybe you've only been here the last couple of weeks, so we're on this series that Jesus preached this powerful message called the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most famous uh, you know, talks of all time, and it's found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and they're all countercultural principles. But what's, what I love about these principles or these values is they have, a, they have a promise attached to them. So it says, blessed are those, and, and it says, then there's a four, for theirs, and it will give something that is a reward for doing what Jesus is encouraging us to do. And last week we had Begi Masikana. Did you guys enjoy him? I'm actually going to go preach at Be- uh, Giba straight after this. I was going to say Be- go preach at Begi, uh, at Giba straight after the service. And it was just awesome to have him last week. Um, did he tell you the story in the morning service about um, me landing on his bed in the early hours of the morning uh, by kicking my toe? Did he tell you that? He told the evening service people. So we went up last week to um, a conference. And so we were sharing a room together. And it, it wasn't too early, but it was dark, okay? So I go to the, the bathroom. And on the way, I kick my toe on the side of his bed. I'm like, ah. And I don't want to wake him because he's fast asleep. So I'm like, ah. Anyway, go to the bathroom, come on the way back, I kick my left toe on the same post. I'm like, Dish. but this time it was too painful. I literally dropped in agony on his bed. He got such a, oh, for this, what are you doing? Like, like landed on him. I, I thought I almost broke my toe, but anyway. So we, we had a lack of time together at this conference. And Beggy spoke about um, blessed are those who are persecuted for, for doing the right thing, for, 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 righteous, for righteousness. And it speaks about for theirs is the kingdom. So when we stand up in a world that is so divided and so, uh, I mean, stuff's going down, you know, all over the world, values, morals. And when we stand up for what is right, it it speaks about a blessing comes. And he used the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where they were uh, required to bow down to a false god, and they just wouldn't do it. And we cannot bow to culture, friends. We cannot bow to what a, the world system is telling us to do, and we've got to stand up for what is right, and that's what last week was, and that's why certain scholars believe there is actually um, nine Beatitudes instead of eight. It's just the last one mentions the first part of it, blessed or the persecuted, but it actually has two separate or parts to it. So last week was part one, blessed are those, you know, uh, is, for righteous sake, we stand up for what is right, then this week requires a different response. And even if you look at the story of Shadrach, uh, Meshach, and Abednego, um, that as, as they stood up for what is right, you know, there was, there was promotion that came. And even if you look at the story of Daniel as well, as he stood up for what was right, promotion and influence came, and he was able to love well. And so there's a different response required of us, and you're going to figure that out in Blessed are the Persecuted Part 2. So if you've got your Bibles, or you can look up on the screen, but we're going to pick up the last verse of this series. And it says this. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? Okay, you asked for it, because I wasn't going to then say anything, because it's really difficult. eh? Are you ready for it? You sure? Okay. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. That's the response that is required when these types of things happen. I know sometimes our response wants to be different, but it says rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we see a different response. The response is to rejoice. It's a different type of attitude. When people criticize you, hurt you, insult you, God calls us to rejoice. Now, some of you right now are saying, how the heck can that be a blessing (laughs) when people persecute you? And we're going to go a little deeper as we end the series. And going deeper doesn't mean going long, by the way, just in case you're thinking that. But we're going to go a little bit deeper. There are things that God wants to do in us that he's yet to do. And there are things in us that he needs to do so that we can become who he wants us to become. So you're ready to go deeper. 
You know there's that scripture that often people quote about you make, like in my weakness, I am strong. You know that one? We, we like that part. Like, God, when I'm weak, yes, you come and make me strong. But often a lot of scripture is, uh, I don't want to say necessarily misquoted, but it's quoted out of context, not understanding the full fullness of the verse. So that particular scripture, which you've all heard, look at where it comes from. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. And it says, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. You see this rejoicing in the weakness. In not just weakness, but in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. So we like this idea, oh, I'm just feeling a little bit tired, a little bit deflated. A little. God, come and make me strong. But there's a whole lot more to it. When, when people insult you, when you have hardships in life, persecutions. And what's amazing, in, if we go back to the Sermon on the Mount, in this rejoice and be glad, so this, this is the preamble, the first part is the Beatitudes to, to, to a whole lot of things that Jesus says. Do you want to know the next verse after blessed are the persecuted? I don't know if you maybe realize this or piece this together, but the next verse because it's almost like Jesus is setting us up, just like I'm setting you up to take you on a journey of a message, right? And the next verse in Matthew 5, 13, so after the Beatitudes, is this. You are the salt of the earth. We've heard that one before. You are the light of the world. And then it says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, God wants us to bring a different standard, a different response to the world. When we go through difficulties and hardships, he wants us to help these things for other people taste better. Blessed, after the blessings of persecution, you're the salt of the earth. And, and how many times do we know we need to add salt on food to add flavor, to bring out the flavor in the food? Salt also purifies. It also, it also preserves. And God wants us, that, that's the requirement of us. And God is calling us to a different response when we have hatred, when we have false accusation, when we have persecution. And in the last couple of years, I would think that we'd all agree that frustration and anger and hatred has ramped up. Would you agree? I mean, I just find there's a lot of mad people out there. People are angry. People are frustrated. And I get that, you know, we've gone through some stuff. And, you know, businesses are still recovering. Marriages, marriages are still recovering. And there's a lot that we've gone through, and the one, I'm, I'm, to be honest, as you can ask my wife, I'm very patient, but the one area I'm working on is being patient on the road. <laughs> I drive the road to Maritzburg often because kids are up at school that way. <laughs> Anyone drive that road regularly? Yo, it's, it's crazy. I, I don't know how Tom Paxton does it, so Tom leads our church in Maritzburg. I said to him last week, because I preached there last week, I was like, I'd have to repent before I ever preached, uh, you know, every Sunday here in Marysburg. That road is just horrendous. The trucks just are crazy. They just take up all the lanes now. And also what I'm finding is that people don't, you know that whole keep left, pass right thing? It just doesn't happen anymore. So I'm like, I just, I just pray for patience. You know, Lord, just give me patience, give me patience. But I do find that people get mad on the road, and, and, and I understand that. Just being open and honest with you today. It's the one area God is uh, working on me. Uh, Matthew 24, 10 says this. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Luke 17, 1 says, and then his disciples, he said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offense should come, or that we shouldn't have an opportunity for offense. And then you're saying, well, what's wrong with being offended? Because there are hurtful things that sent, get sent, said about me or whatever it is, can I be offended? But look what Proverbs 18 says. It says, an offended brother or sister is more unyielding than a fortified city and disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel, which is like a fortress. And the problem with offense is that you actually end up building a wall around your heart. You can see the imagery here in the Bible, which stops others from coming close to you, but then it also unfortunately translates to your relationship with God, offense. And we have a generation of people that have never been more offended. I'm finding it more and more and more. Everyone's offended. Now, I didn't say this. Everyone has the opportunity to be offended because that, that's true. But everyone, a lot of people are taking that opportunity of offense and actually letting it 
stick in their hearts. It becomes a fortress. And I want to give you today kind of four principles of the response that we should have to insults and accusations and hardships. They're challenging. And can I just tell you right up front, the four get more difficult as we go along. Is that okay? Are you ready for a bit of a workout in church? Because, I mean, if we come to church and God doesn't work in our heart or stir in our heart and we don't leave different, what's the point? It's like going to gym. You know, you get those people that just go do a few little squats. You know, the squats like this. Apparently, when you do a squat, you've got to go right down so it actually hurts here. I mean, we've all tried to get away with those things. I remember Jim roped me into CrossFit for a season. It was absolutely dreadful. I nearly died the one time. But um, <laughs> there's a proper way to do a sit-up. There's a proper way to do a push-up. I've been doing push-ups uh, recently, and uh, my boobs are on fire. Even right now, they're a bit sore. <laughs> Got to be honest. But um, there's a proper way to do exercise. You know, uh, you can't just go and, you know, look around, you know, the gym and do a few little things. And, you know, and then you come out, whew, I'm so, you know. You've got to get your heart rate up. Like even with these watches, when you go for a run, it, it shows you the zone that your heart has been in through the workout. And this morning, our heart rate should increase just a little bit because it's like, ooh, that, that, that burns a bit. If we want to be blessed, the word makarios, happy are those, we need to understand them and we need to get ready for them. Okay, so the first is this. So when we have an opportunity for offense, are you ready? The first is choose to overlook the offense. Proverbs 10, 12 says, love overlooks the wrongs that others do. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm just saying what the Bible says. Proverbs 12, 16 says, when a fool is annoyed, he quickly lets it be known. Do you feel when you're offended or hurt that you have to tell everybody to try and get people to validate your feelings? Or come on to your side so that they understand, so that you can deal with your hurt. I'm not saying it's uh, wrong to speak to people. I think it's important to, I mean, I think even spouses are there for that and certain deep friendships are there for that. But when a fool is annoyed, he quickly lets it be known. Wise people will ignore an insult. Proverbs 19.11 says, a man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Maybe you're saying, well, that's cool for you, Hilton, but like you're just letting them off then. You're just letting them off. I remember sometimes at school, you know, I was a Christian and people used to insult me a bit. Um, they, used to call me, <laughs> they used to call me Samson because they're like, I tried to always stretch the boundaries of longer hair. Uh, they also called me the holy goalie because I was a goalkeeper in hockey. And that wasn't because I let the ball through, because it was holy, if that makes sense, but because I was known as a Christian. And I do remember, though, sometimes being quite, like, offended and hurt when they would, you know, I promise you, people used to, like, try and make me swear. They would just get in my face. And, and sometimes I, I would actually argue with them, and, and, and I shouldn't. I should have just, the Bible speaks about reasoning so that you can win someone over. And so often when you feel offended, you just want to, you just want to bite back, Right? But I don't think it's helpful. And one of the things that I've learned through life, and it is maybe one of the way, I mean, God wise us all different, differently, but um, I cannot understand unkindness. I can't. I really, really can't. I'm not saying I don't have the ability to be unkind because I have been. But when someone is unkind, I just, I battle. I just can't understand it. And the way, maybe that's why I do what I do, I suppose. But having a heart of empathy for people and understanding Rather, their situation above yours and your reason to be offended is very helpful. You see, empathy does this. When someone insults you, you say, in your heart, you're going, I wonder what they're going through for them to be like that, for them to say something like that. You see, because hurt people hurt people. And instead of maybe feeling mad at them, is feel sorry for them. But not in this type of way, <laughs> feel sorry for you really feel sorry for them because of what they've been through in their life. And when our kids have been bullied at school, I think every kid is bullied at some season of their life. I often, and I know the traditional way is, is guys, you know, especially as a guy, just hit him back or whatever, whatever, if, especially if it's physical or push him or, you know, just stand your ground. And, but I often, and we have often tried to explain to our kids that sometimes 
you don't know what that person's going through. And often the, the people that are the bullies are the ones that have had some hardships in life, that have got broken families, that are dealing with something. So they just feel a need just to vent that frustration and anger. And I've tried to make my kids understand that just to pray for them, feel sorry for them, be kind to them, because that's the only way they know how. And empathy has this ability to go above and beyond what is the natural. And there's this beautiful quote. It says, love or empathy looks past the behavior and imagines the pain in their life. Going back to my uh, patients on the road, maybe it's a good thing for you and for me, those who struggle, is to go, maybe that person that just cuts you off is in an emergency Maybe they're on their way to the hospital. They're probably not. <laughs> but it might help us have a different attitude towards what they're going through. If someone flips the bird at you, swears at you on the road, maybe, I don't know, they're going through some difficulty at home. Have the aircons just come on? Yeah. Wonderful. So that's the first one. Choose to overlook the offense. In a world that's got so nasty, so mean, so revengeful, so unkind. We have to have a different attitude. And the second thing is keep your heart free from unforgiveness. Now, the word unforgiveness is actually not a real word. It's almost crept its way into culture. If you don't believe me, go to the dictionary and type unforgiveness. It's not there. Because it's impossible to unforgive someone. Once you've forgiven someone, it's been released. You can't unforgive. You can have an, an unforgiving heart, meaning you have not yet forgiven, but you can't have unforgiveness because once forgiveness is done, it's, it can't be undone. You know, like on the phone, shake to undo. <laughs> someone said that that circulate button on the air con, you know, that little return button is to undo an accident if you had one. Imagine you could just push that button, undo, and your car just be amazing. But many of us have bitterness, and we have unforgiveness in our hearts, and it actually becomes a dream stopper. It stops us from what God wants to do in and through our life. And one of the most helpful things to do is to pray the Lord's Prayer. Do you remember in Blessed Are the Merciful, we unpacked a little bit of the Lord's Prayer, and it's so powerful because it says this in Luke 11, 4, it says, and forgive our sins. And in this version, the TLB says, for we have forgiven those who sinned against us. It's past tense. So the idea is this, forgive me, God, because I'm already in the process of forgiving other people. I'm not gonna wait for them to forgive me before I forgive them. You almost have to decide ahead of time that you're going to forgive people when they hurt you. We decide in advance, believe the best. I have been hurt because of that. Really, I have. And as I said to you, this series, <laughs> whew, I can't even go down that road, but it's been crazy. But decide ahead of time that you're going to forgive before you get hurt. Imagine we woke up every day and said, God, just I already forgive those who are going to hurt me today, those that are going to offend me today, those who are going to cut me off in traffic today. I forgive them. Isn't it powerful? Imagine we had an attitude of, you're just not going to be able to offend me. It doesn't matter what you say, you're not going to be able to offend me. And I've seen and met people in my lifetime that have every reason to be offended, hurt, frustrated, particularly even at God. Like I had the privilege of meeting a guy called Nick Vujic, who has no arms and no legs. And he actually came and preached at the church and I went to dinner with him. I was like, how's this guy gonna eat his burger? Like, does he just lean down? And he travels with a friend that helps put him in his mouth. And he's had to learn to deal with that bitterness and that hurt. Like, why is he made like this? And he said it took him 21 years of his life to say, thank you, God, I don't have arms and legs so that God could use his story, and he's been all over the world. And I don't know if you follow him on you know, social media, but what a, what a joy and a blessing he is to the world. No arms and no legs. There's someone on our staff who has had a real, real light, tough journey in life, has every reason to be bitter and offended, but is able to love, is able to forgive. I love this quote by Lewis 
um, B. Smitty says this, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Isn't that powerful? See, when we persecuted, slandered, spoken badly of, forgive them in advance. Just say, God, I just forgive them. You're not going to be able to offend me. I said these get harder and harder and harder. Are you ready to go to a higher level? We're on point three. Are you ready? Or well, some of you are saying, please stop. Can you, just, can, you just, can you just do this over two weeks so I can just process what you said? Sure, I, I got to tell you, these have been really, really challenging the last two months. So not only does God ask us to forgive in advance, so this is hard. Are you ready? The Bible actually asks us, point three, is to pray, bless, and do good to them. The Bible actually says, speak well of them. That's what the word bless actually means there. Pray for them. Some of you are saying, I'll pray for them. I'll pray the fleas of a thousand camels to infest their armpits. <laughs> Hemorrhoids in Jesus' name. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We can't be praying things like that, right? Pray for them. Pray that God blesses them. Speak well of them. But then the Bible takes it to another level, another level and he says, actually do good to them. Find need that they have and help them. Whew. See, the Romans, they actually had a God of revenge that they worshipped. And Jesus was speaking to, in this particular sermon, to Romans and Jewish people. The Jewish people had a, a saying, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And then he comes along, and they also were familiar with, you know, um, this, this whole idea of, well, they created the whole culture of turn the other cheek, and this is where it comes from. In Matthew 5, 38, it says, You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to them the other cheek also. This is where it comes from. I heard a story of a guy who, <laughs> who um, became friends with this, uh, this Muslim guy. And he said, I can show you something in your Bible that you don't believe. And he was sitting down and reading his Bible at the time. And uh, he said, well, no, there isn't. He says, no, I, I promise you not. I can prove it to you that you don't believe it. So he says, well, come and show me then what? So he thought the guy was going to come across and pull out a scripture, but the guy just whacked him across the face. He was like, oh, what, what, what is that for? He says, your Bible says, turn the other cheek. He says, now turn the other cheek. He's like, what the heck? Like, what are you doing? And this guy then turned the other cheek. He said, hit me again. And he says, nah, you don't believe it, man. He says, he says, hit me again. He says, no, rubbish, you, you don't believe it. He says, hit me again. <laughs> he got whacked again. He was like, you're the first Christian I've ever met. He says, like, are you mad? Do you go around hitting people like, you know? <laughs> and this guy was able to lead him to the Lord one year later. Isn't that powerful? Turn the other cheek. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. See, the Bible's calling us not to react, but to respond in a different way. Reaction is instantaneous. We feel like when there's a, a reaction, like in science, it, it immediately reacts to something. And when we end up reacting, we end up often doing something wrong. But when we respond in a different way, it, it can actually not only draw us to God, but draw other people to God. Matthew 5, 43 says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Luke 6, 27 says, But I tell you, who hear me, love your enemies. This is the same account, but in a different uh, version. Obviously, you've got Matthew and Luke. It says, Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Speak well of those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Can I just encourage us as a church to, to stop cursing people? Seriously. I see it on social media all the time. It's crazy how people just feel they have a right just to, just to call someone out. Are you, like, that was a stupid comment. You, are you thick? Are you silly? Are you mad? It, you see it all the time, don't you? 
It's like people just feel they have this right. God's called us to a higher level. Can I encourage us as a church to just not be those people? I don't know what it is about social media, for those of you who are on it, that feel that you have the right to say that to someone you would never say to someone's face. Can I also encourage you when you're speaking about someone that you supposedly respect but then say ugly things and unkind things about them, but you would never say it to their face, but you feel that you have the right to say it behind their backs. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And when we're receiving these types of insults, where people have cursed us, could we get to a place where we go like, I I don't care what you have to say. I've tried to explain that to my kids, man, when they engage in stuff where people are being unkind. Um, there was a little kid that I met before the service that said he, he got bullied because he was in the choir. Right now, before the service in the foyer. And I said, they're just jealous because you can sing. And when they tell you that you're a loser or you're a nerd, just say, thanks, my buddy, and just walk away. I know it's so hard because it, when we're young, we don't have the emotional EQ just to leave those conversations. Sometimes even when we're adults, we don't, right? But just say thanks and walk away. 1 Peter 3, do not do wrong to repay a wrong. And do not insult to repay an insult. But repay with a blessing, speaking well of. Because you yourself will be called to do this so that you might receive a blessing. Blessed are those. And if you think praying and just blessings are enough for speaking well of, this challenged me more than anything. Are you ready for it? Because I learned something new in preparing this. Are you ready? Some of you said yes, so I'm going to go, because I wasn't going to say it. Are you ready? I could just end the message here. Romans 12, 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We spoke about that. Blessed are the peacemakers. I hate it, like if there's no peace. I really do. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I never understood what heap burning coals on his head meant. I was like, yes, burn that oak up. <laughs> God, deal with him. But I did some research into this because I was like burning coals on his head. Like, geez, that sounds hectic. So do you know that burning coals were, well, it's a great commodity in those days because they didn't have like fire lighters and matches like we did. To keep a fire going was very important. Kind of like if you were out camping to keep that fire going and you'd want to keep the coals going overnight so they would try and preserve the coals so that in the morning when they come to heat up or to cook something, they would just add a few coals and then they wouldn't have to relight or remake the fire. And then what would happen out of a sign of goodwill or gesture or kindness that sometimes a neighbor would come across with some burning coals and place them on top of the other coals as goodwill to help, to bless them. So this, this word heap coals is actually a good thing. And if you actually just go Google what does burning or heap coals mean, it, it's to cause someone to fear remorse by returning good for evil. God will deal with them. God, God will do, so some, when, when they have been returned a favor, when they've actually insulted you or hurt you, and you do something good, God will work in their hearts. Because they're like, I just don't understand how you could be kind to me when I've actually been unkind to you. Another meaning of this is remorse and embarrassment actually for the harm done or increased punishment for refusing reconciliation. It's like God will start to deal with them. You just keep doing good. That's what heaping burning coals means. Did you learn something? There's this incredible poem that I want to read and it's by Rudyard Kipling. He's, a, he's an author and he, um, he wrote it... Uh, to his son. It's so powerful. 
Are you ready for it? I think it'll be up on the screen there. It says, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. You know what the word allowance is? It's like a kind of money for, that you can have to spend kind of at will when you like. So just give an allowance for people that doubt you. If you can wait and not be tired of waiting or being lied about, don't deal in the lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreamers your master, or dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools, if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone. And so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that is in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Pretty powerful. So we overlook offense, we forgive in advance, we pray, we speak well of, and we do good. And it leads to my last point as we come to a close this whole series. And let me set this last point up by saying this, and it's a pretty bold statement, but this is the single greatest key to happiness on earth. Well, arguably, the single greatest key to happiness on earth. You see, we don't put it all here on earth, but we set our sights on, heavens and point, on heaven. And point four is this, remember the eternal reward. As Christians, we have to be satisfied to have a delayed gratification that we might not see yet what we've invested this side of eternity, but our reward may still come. The restoration of our heart, the healing of our souls will come one day. And Paul, I think he got this. He knew the secret to this. And Paul, I think above anyone else in the Bible, he wrote a lot of the New Testament could speak into this. Just to give context, Paul was someone who received 39 lashes five times. This is not lashes with like a little uh, wooden spoon. Okay, this, this, this was lashes with leather thongs with bits of bone and stone and they would actually pull, it would rip your back open. I mean, it's the same lashes Jesus received. They wouldn't do 40 because 40, they reckon you, could, you, you would die. Now, I know some of you got lashed at school. You will never, ever forget that. You got lashed once or twice, maybe six of the best. Do you remember that? Anyone got caned at school? You will never forget that. This guy got 39 lashes five times. Okay? He was shipwrecked. He was bitten by snakes. I'm terrified of snakes. I mean, just, I think one bite of a snake would literally, like, torment me for life. <laughs> he was in prison. He was stoned. Some of you say, well, at least he got a little bit of relief if he was stoned. Not that type of stoned. <laughs> he had rocks thrown at him. And this is what he says. 2 Corinthians 4, 8. We are hard pressed on every side. Yeah, for sure. I can understand that. But not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Do you remember that song some of us used to sing? I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my sorrows. Remember that? Blessed, persecuted, destroyed. I mean, I actually thought about singing it this morning, but I, I've actually forgotten the chords. So Mike's been trying to get me to lead worship again for, for a while now. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm preaching. I can't. Maybe soon. But a beautiful song. And then 
Paul says this a few verses later, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. We've got to have a different perspective that we live for eternity. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. He had that perspective, that perspective to remember the eternal work, uh, reward. You see, for us, earth is more important than heaven many times. But we've got to have a different perspective. It's countercultural. We've got to be patient in waiting for the well done, good and faithful servant. And any person that I've seen develop any greatness in life or do great things, let me tell you, they've had some hardship and plenty of it. And to end the series, the persecution that I've been speaking about more today is more about like some hardships and insults and um, you know, when you get ripped off a little bit for being a Christian. And I, I, I really do understand that. I, I really do, because I've experienced that a lot in my life. And in subtle ways that maybe you wouldn't understand, but doing what I, I do, being a pastor, um, I get, it's very subtle, but often people have a perception or a thinking about someone like me, what I do. Um, we can often get excluded from, from things not necessarily always just have normal friendships because you also got to be the pastor, right? But as you get to know people, sometimes um, you can develop close friendships, but also sometimes as you get close to someone, you can also let people down because we're not perfect, right? And Jin and I have experienced that. I know my parents would have, but we've been through things. I understand. And sometimes I'm like, God, why did you call me to do this? It's not easy. Sometimes it would have been easier just to get a normal job, <laughs> to be honest. But then I have a, a moment. My persecution is nothing compared to what some other people have been through. We've got no idea what persecution is. I woke up this morning, had a choice of clothes to wear. You like my new jacket? Jim and I went to her 40th last night and we went matchy matchy as pink and black. I actually came straight from the party here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I did get a little sleep though. We're sitting in an air conditioned room. I'm glad that came on because that was in my notes. We, we're pretty spoiled. Living in a place like we do. I know we've got hardships. I know many of us, uh, there's different, you know, economic sectors and graphics, you know, demographics, yeah, I, I get all of that, but we're we, we pretty blessed. And there are other people out there in the world today that are experiencing persecution that you will never, ever experience or hope you never experience. And I wanted to just take a moment. Can we, can we give a, a hand and a cheer to the missionary and the martyrs out there today? Can we do that? Come on. There are people out there where we feel like we're dying inside. There are people out there who are physically dying, persecuted for their faith. And I want to close um, this series on a, a story I read up on yesterday. I don't know if you've heard of Jim Elliott. He was a missionary kind of mid-1950s, and he and a group of buddies started to do missionary work in Ecuador. And um, he... Uh, there was a group of people that had never been reached, never seen. They were deep in the jungle. And they actually flew over with airplanes and would start drop t dropping gifts so that there would be the sense of, okay, these people are here to help us. And he actually uh, slowly, then, then they landed the one time and they, they, would, um, they connected with someone. And then they decided to set up a missionary base quite close to this people group. They didn't know much about this people group, but obviously very tribal in, in the way that they were and... Um, also quite aggressive up front and came with spears, but they eventually started to build a, a bit of rapport with, with some of them. And the one day, um, Jim Elliott and four of his buddies decided to go take a whole lot of Bibles and food into this community, and they were met with a mob of 10 angry uh, tribal people, and they were all speared to death. He had a wife and a, a young child at the time that was 
set up in the missionary base. Can you imagine how difficult that would have been? She continued in Jim Elliott's work, and there's been a few books written about him, and there's actually been a movie. Uh, it's, it's called, I think, The End of the Spear. And his wife wrote his autobiography. And you see, we, we give so much here on earth, and we think this is all it is. But there is a greater gain if we lose our life here on earth to God's kingdom. We have gain in heaven. And he wrote this quote. Well, it's in Jim Elliot's autobiography that his wife took from writings. And it took me a while to understand it and read it and process it. But yeah, you will find it on the screen today as we end the series. And it's that underlined part. And it says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And he was speaking about his life. This was before he died. You're not a fool if you give what you cannot keep. We cannot keep our lives forever. We will all die one day. But one promise that we have in eternity is we face persecution that we cannot lose is eternity with him. And the blessings and the rewards, the crowns, the honoring, the well done, my good and faithful servant for what you do this side. Isn't that powerful? So I haven't really processed how to end the service beyond what I've just shared now, but I think we just need to take a moment. I know we're over time. Just to, to pray and respond to God. Lord, we, um, we, we really do thank you and for your word. Sometimes it's hard to thank you because it's, it's so difficult. And, and these words that pierce to our hearts, sometimes they, they're not easy to receive and to take, particularly you know, if we've been through things in our life. But we, but we know, God, that you love us and know what's best for us. And I pray, God, that you would help us today have a different response to all that we've learned over the past two months. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. So beautiful. All these countercultural principles, and they've deeply challenged us, God. Blessed are those who mourn. And I pray as we um, wrap up the series, God, it's just been amazing to see what you've done in our hearts. And I know I don't speak just for myself, but I'm sure for many of us here today, we've, we've been challenged. And I pray more than anything, God, that we would have a different response, that we would take these words and put them into practice, that we would practice what we preach. And today, God, when it comes to hardships, insults, persecution, that we would have a different response, and that is to rejoice to give thanks, to pray for those that do this to us. Pray for those, God. Speak well of those. Do good to those. And maybe in closing today, if, I wanna say if, when you were hurt, which I think we all have been, take a moment just to think about some of those people now. And I'm sure there's all sense of emotion that could come up. But can I ask you to release that today? I don't say that lightly because I don't know what you've been through. But God's asking you to do that. And it might be a journey to process, but just whisper under your breath, I forgive them. And that might even be an act of faith today. You, you say something, but you do not yet feel in alignment with, but just say it. I forgive them. And then now take a moment just to pray for them. Say, God, would you bless them? Would you help them? And then from today on, speak well of them. 
That's where it could get difficult. Because whenever you've defaulted and just spoke negatively about someone, start to speak well of them. And then if you want to go to the third stage, is actually do good to them. Maybe they aren't in your life anymore, so that's, that's fine. But maybe you can trust that someone else that knows them or around them would just, they would receive blessings. <laughs> it's hard to pray, right? God, help us with that today. And I pray that you would, by your spirit, help us because we cannot do this on our own. But how freeing and releasing is your spirit. Rejoice and be glad. I said I didn't process how this was going to end, but if you have prayed that prayer today, and it, it's been a struggle, but you really mean it, I just felt God telling you right now, stand up, just stand up right now, and lift your arms, and just rejoice, and be glad. Come on, if you're in that place, and you're to identify with that, just stand up, and put a smile on your face, and say, thank you, Jesus, for setting me free today. Come on, people standing up all over the room here today. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free today. Isn't that beautiful? See? It's amazing. Come on. There's someone you still need to stand up, but you're still battling with this bitterness. You're battling with pride. You're battling with all these things. Just stand up today. And as you stand up, I pray there will be such a weight that will come off your shoulders today that it will feel such a release today. Such a release. There's still more people that need to stand. There's still more people that need to stand. Come on. If you know you need to stand today, just stand up right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for setting people free here today in Jesus' name. Isn't it amazing? Awesome. Awesome. Amazing. Come on, for those of you who are still sitting, just give these guys a hand and just celebrate with them today. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Those standing, you can just start to celebrate even right now. Come on, that's amazing. Awesome. Yes, Lord. Okay, let's all stand together. Let's all stand together. And we're going to pray one final prayer. And if you're here today and you don't know this Jesus that we've been speaking about, this forgiving Jesus that forgave you, that you then can offer forgiveness to someone else, you've never received Jesus into your life, I'm gonna pray a quick prayer. If you'd like to pray for the first time, never prayed it before, I wanna pray that prayer with you. While all eyes are closed, if you would wanna pray that prayer today, just put your hand right now on your heart and pray after me. Pray nice and loud, every single one of us. Dear Lord Jesus, from today, I commit my life to you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. I ask you to come and live in my heart by your spirit and be Lord of my life. I'm sorry for my past and I ask you to forgive me. And from today, Lord, I choose you and I want to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's just celebrate that today. Amazing. Yes. Well, thank you, church. We are a little bit over time, but it, God did something in our hearts. If you are visiting us today for the first time, we'd love to meet you. You can go straight to Guest Central. Coffee is on us. And just God bless you as you go today. We've got an evening service tonight at 6 p.m. You're welcome to come back or bring a friend. But God bless everybody. Thank you.